Welcome to episode 49 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time, and Dad, well, it represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Vaccines, Passports, and Tweets, where I'm joined by Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary, and today we'll discuss some of the latest controversy regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. So, let's dive right in. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing pretty good, DL. How are you doing today, buddy? Uh, very well. So, just kind of a lead-in for people that are watching today. What Josh and I are going to talk about, we're going to we're going to kind of touch upon vaccines a little bit, and then we'll kind of dive into the the vaccine passport that you've been hearing about, and then we'll uh, we'll end it talking about that infamous uh, Libertarian Party of Kentucky tweet that you probably already know about, and hopefully this is going to be a very informative show, and um let's see what else that i want to point out oh yeah and i wanted to point out that unfortunately i have been so swamped i have not done a bill review so we will not be conducting one today so the show is going to be entirely talking about vaccines and related stuff so josh i before the show we were discussing that you would lead in a little bit with with talking about vaccines and i know i have some thoughts but of course josh is the medical professional of the two of us here i am not unless being a hypochondriac has some at some point become a profession. Uh, but other than that, I have no medical training whatsoever. So Josh, tell me a little bit about vaccines. Uh, well, WebMD and Google can make a lot of us doctors anymore, it seems. Right. Um, no, uh, you know, talking about um, the vaccine passport and vaccines in general, it's, it's kind of important for people to understand where we initially stand on vaccines. Uh, right. Personally, uh, I am, I, I guess if you would have to label me, I would be a pro, pro-vax uh, individual. Um, as long as um, the science is solid, and by mm-hmm. science, and I, I, I'm not trying to say science as in, oh, you can't question the science. I mean, objective right. data that we have, we have determined that something is, is safe. Um, if that's the case, then I, I do believe in, in vaccines. Uh, my children have all been vaccinated. Uh, right, there's right. a lot of vaccines that I, I give to patients uh, very comfortably, uh, knowing that it's a wise medical decision. Um, <clears throat> but that being said, um, any medication, vaccine or not, needs to be scrutinized objectively. And the science never is fully settled. It, I like mm-hmm. to say it's like to our best understanding, this this vaccine or this medication is safe. It, we always do this um, post-market surveillance where we're constantly studying the effects of a vaccine or a new drug. Uh, so if anybody, you know, so we don't have like, it's absolutely safe. There's no questioning it. No, it's, it's, it's in a constant state of questioning. Uh, but from where I fall, definitely pro-vax uh, in general. But like I said, there's a caveat to that. As long as we scrutinize uh, everything for safety and efficacy. Gotcha. And so when you say pro-vax, and it kind of sounded like you were alluding to it just a moment ago, does that mean you are pro every vax? Of course not. Um, okay. Each each uh, vaccine, each medication, um, every single chemical, it, it stands alone, stands apart, mm-hmm. and has to be scrutinized apart. So, um, pro-vax is it's like one of those general things. Either you're anti-vax, you're pro-vax. Well, I, I'm, and I hate to even say it now. I'm pro-science because what does that mm-hmm. even mean? Um, I, I want to be objective about it. So right, every right. Va- every single vaccine has to stand on its own merit. Okay? Gotcha. So it doesn't all get grouped together and it would be a disservice, especially when we're talking about like COVID vaccines mm-hmm. to group them together. Uh, Cause some of them are our original type tech vaccines and some of them are RNA tech, uh, mRNA tech vaccines. So okay. to, you can't compare those two. So if you say oh, I'm pro COVID vaccine, well, we, we have five different methodologies of doing that now, which one are you talking about? Right. Uh, so, and I have very different feelings about each one. Gotcha. Uh, so no, by and by also too to clarify for people watching, me being pro-vax does not mean in any way that I, I advocate for anything being mandatory. Okay. Um, you know, I could support you getting it and thinking it's a good idea, but I certainly am not going to advocate the use of force to make you get it. Gotcha. Uh, 
that's counterproductive to the first do no harm clause. So, Gotcha. And then the other question I have, and let me, before I get to my other question here, let me point out for, for anybody that's watching that I too would consider myself to be Provax in the same way that you have just described. So I look at uh, pharmaceuticals in general, I look at them relatively individually. I have some criteria that I try to use before I consume them. One of my particular criteria is that I want pharmaceuticals to be on the market for a good length of time. Now, what is, I don't have an exact time. I kind of usually say like 10 years, but that's not a fixed actual number that I, uh, that I rigidly adhere to. It's yeah. just kind of like a way that I describe it to people and say, look, I don't want experimental drugs unless I am in a situation where that is my only hope or that is my best hope. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so it, it, it and, and I'm, and, and I've been like this for quite some time. I remember years ago, uh, I don't know if people remember the, the drug Vioxx was having mm -hmm. some heartburn issues and I can't remember why, but I was prescribed Vioxx and I started, uh, this was when I was really hypochondriac and I started reading the insert and I just flipped out. I was like, oh my Lord, this sounds crazy. Like, and the inserts, unfortunately, they don't give you necessarily, they don't think, I don't think they do a good job of saying, you really have to worry about this. You kind of got to worry about this. You, this is probably something you don't have to worry about, but hey, if it happens, it is a big deal. Like, I don't feel like they really convey that so well. And so I flipped out and then literally a couple of weeks later, it got pulled from the market. Uh, now, the likelihood is that had I been taking it, I probably wouldn't have had a problem. It was pulled from the market because it was causing heart problems with people. But I think that was for long term use. So at any rate, uh, through, through experiences like that, um, I kind of came to this decision where I prefer to use pharmaceuticals, any pharmaceutical that's been on the market for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I will seek an alternative unless it is imperative. So if I'm if I'm in a really serious situation and they're like, look, dude, this drug here um, is your only hope. And I can give you an example of one. Um, and I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but there's uh, African sleeping sickness, which uh, people can get when they're bitten by the tsetse, tsetse fly, I believe is how it, it's pronounced over in Africa. Um, and this African sleeping sickness, um, there are drugs for it, but there is a particular drug if you happen to have late stage African sleeping sickness. And this particular drug is terrible sounding. I mean, the, the WHO recommends that it gets, um, uh, that, that you inject with glass syringes because it um, can cause burning at the injection site and it's known to be caustic to your veins and like five percent of the people that take this drug die like so it's this is a very dangerous now this isn't given like they don't willy-nilly just give this one this is if you have a particular strain of african sleeping sickness and it's late stage so like it's a very very narrow situation but if i was in that situation and they're like look man five percent chance of dying or much much larger chance probably gonna die take your pick i'm yeah. going to pick this other drug even though and you know even regardless of how long it's been on the market or regardless how dangerous it is, dangerous it is because at some point you just have to evaluate risk Mm -hmm. So, so that's my position on, on pharmaceuticals. Um, as far as I know, my son is all up to date on his vaccinations. We, we didn't do it. You know, we just consulted our, our pediatrician. We talked to her. I did a bunch of research and I came to the conclusion that, um, uh, that, that yes, there are possibilities that something could happen. What those possibilities are, I never really got a good grasp of, um, and uh, I didn't really get the impression that it was worth even spacing out the vaccines, um, not any more than the pediatrician already had it set up. Yeah. Uh, because the pediatrician basically was like, look, we're not going to give too many at one time. That way, if there is a reaction, it's easier to identify which one he may be reacting to. Yeah. Um, and so in a couple of cases, like, uh, when we did some travel and stuff like that, she recommended, you know, this one instead of this other one, hold off on this one until you come back, this kind of a situation. 
uh, and, and it was all based on just being able to um, clearly identify if there was a problem, which one caused the problem so that we would be able to uh, appropriately ensure his safety in the future by saying he had a problem with this particular one here it might be why or here are other related pharmaceuticals that he probably should not take mm -hmm. um and so and so that was our position on the matter um now my next question is when you say provax are you provax for everyone like not mandatory just are you the kind of person that says like if you choose not to take it even for a crazy reason i'm going to snub my nose at you Oh, no, 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 no. Like, are you saying like, legally, no, uh, no, no mandatory anywhere at all. Right, so, right. But I'm talking about backing okay. away from legal, like just your opinion, just like personal choices. Like if someone opts out of it, would, would I look down on them for it? Yeah, like, I, let's say I make a post and I say I'm not giving my child his vaccinations because I've been looking at the VAERS system and it looks kind of scary. And I think that there's you know, some huge risk or whatever. And maybe I don't even know what I'm talking about, but maybe, you know, maybe it's clear in the post that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I've, I've made a, a very uneducated um, assessment for my child. Are you going to be like, dude, what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah, you, well, if we're, if we're friends, I'd do it in private, obviously. And, gotcha. and I, okay. I would, I would always, I try at least DL when I'm talking to people to not come across as like, I'm the medical professional, you know, and I know okay, better, okay. Than, you know, which a lot of times it very well may be true, but I'm also in, in the camp of people that believe uh, I'm very much an autodidact. I think if a person sets out and they want to learn something, if they put the time into it, they could learn. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they have to go get a degree or have letters after their name. I, right. I don't I don't equate intelligence with that. So like you saying to me, uh, you know, I don't have any medical background or I don't have. Look, look I know that you've experienced things uh, with uh, with medicine uh, from yourself and with your family members. I know you are very uh, uh, abreast on the stuff that your mom was taking and doing. So mm -hmm. you're not absence knowledge. Right. And you're certainly not absent intellect. So a lot of times what I find is people can understand anything medical. It just takes mm -hmm. a little bit of time and understanding. Now, right. when it comes to vaccines and medications, it gets damn complicated because you have this thing called statistics, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, statistics lie. Right. And you can have a study and part of one of the things that they do in pharmacy school, med school, uh, you spend a significant amount of time studying how to study a study. Okay. Gotcha. Research, right. design, and statistics. <clears throat> so you can pick up like half the studies are greater of the studies that you see posted on mainstream media lack what's called statistical significance, okay. which means that they're not relevant. So whatever conclusion that they come to, the data is not significant enough to the point that it could support their conclusion. Okay. Right. So, and VAERS, VAERS is a great example where people can report side effects. Now, you mentioned a minute ago about not wanting to group vaccines together. Well, they may be safe to group together, but what happens right. if you group them together and you have a side effect? Do you right. know which vaccine caused it? No. Now, say if you're on a lot of medications, this is one of my challenges as a pharmacist. If somebody is having a reaction and say they're taking 10, 12, 15 medications, right. how do I delineate which one it is? So when these side, still, since I can't delineate fully, objectively, it gets reported that this is a side effect to all the drugs encompassing that. Mm. So you got those five vaccines at once and say it caused hives. It gets reported to VAERS, each one of those, that it caused hives. Okay. Okay. So this, this is where the, the scrutinizing, hopefully objective professional comes in, looks at the data, looks at your case and says this your objective risk is, is relatively low, even though you may get on there and see something completely different. Um, so that, that's often how, that's quite how the autism got correlated with vaccines. It was one of those uh, correlation is causation fallacies. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, and obviously that study has been debunked, uh, but, right. but we see that a lot. So you say, and you look at VAERS, uh, you know, it, it's got to be scrutinized. Like there might be some things on there, like you mentioned Biox. Now, see, that's an interesting one. Biox 
it has two chemical cousins that would have done the same thing to you if you would have taken them that are on the market still. It's because okay. now we know not to give it to certain people in certain population bases. If you okay. have, you have this type of ailment, if you have uh, uh, reflux, if you have uh, GERD, something like that, taking mm -hmm. Biox can be very dangerous for your stomach. Now we have Celebrix and we have uh, Mobic, which are both those selective two COX uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Uh, they're all in that same family. Now Viox has a little bit more activity, uh, but still, if you would have taken Celebrix, most likely you would have engaged the same thing. Because of the Vioxx debacle, they learned that, oh, there's a segment of the population who should not take this drug. They learned from it. And then obviously, uh, Mobic and Celebrix are not prescribed to people who have right. acid um, we've found the same thing uh, with uh, uh, bone decay, with uh, the bisphosphonates, drugs like Prilosec. So there's stuff we learn after the fact all the time, but we always need to be scrutinizing uh, right. each individual drug. And to directly answer you, like with the pro the Provax, if someone asked me if a friend is making a, a post like I'm not going to get this because of some misinformation, let me tell you, 10 years ago, it was much easier for me to come out and um, not even 10 years ago, five years ago, it was much easier for me to come out on their page or, you know, whatever publicly and say, hey, man, you know, maybe you want to uh, check these and these and these studies out. That study lacks significance. And it would be a cordial conversation. Right. Uh, objective, you know, now the past few years, I can say something objective uh, or be scrutinizing something. And that misinformation is so ingrained. Um, right. And also too the mistrust in the sciences. Right. We've done that to ourselves because we have several leading scientists and leading scientific organizations that are peddling false science. Gotcha. And people know that blatantly. So it causes a disruption into almost any kind of intellectual realm. If, if you question right. so it's a, it's a problem, but now I, I would probably send someone a private message or not even address it at all, to be honest with you. Um, Cause it's, you know, it, if people don't want to be harped at about medical things, right. I, you know, I feel I know like part of it has been how we communicated, uh, how we've had the conversation. This is one of the reasons why I, why I am so big on how we communicate different ideas. Yeah. And, and let me kind of give you this idea that I have in mind, and I would like to hear your thoughts on it. I've, I've had some other friends that disagree with me that are in the medical community, uh, not necessarily trained medical uh, like doctors and whatnot, but uh, it's regarding the uh, vaccines and the herd immunity threshold. And at any time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my thoughts at any time. If I say something that's wildly inaccurate or just you, you can either interrupt or you can just kind of write a note down and, and, and mention it after the fact. Um, but my understanding of the herd immunity threshold is that everybody generally understands what herd immunity is that when enough people have immunity it basically stops a, a virus or a disease from uh from being transferred from person to person in other words it can't spread and and basically infect us all and so yes. when you start looking up herd immunity threshold you find out that there is a percentage um under of of people that need to be either vaccinated or need to have immunity in order for a particular disease to, uh, I, I think we call it eradicated, but let's just go with stop flowing through society. In other words, it it, it doesn't. It, it's the outbreak that you 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 could have, you don't have, and there are different thresholds for for different um, diseases. So, for instance, uh, I believe it's measles has like a low 90s, which means like 92, 93, somewhere around there percent of the population need to be vaccinated in order to prevent a measles outbreak. Yes. And then you've got something like, you know, that's very different in percentage. You have the flu, which I believe is somewhere around 34% of the population in order for it to, to and us, us not to have a major outbreak. Now, what's interesting about that, and another friend has pointed out, he said, you know, that, 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 that scales. So you might have 90 some percent nationally, but then you also need 90 some percent in the state and maybe even 90 some percent in a locale like a city. Because if 
one entire city was not vaccinated, but every other city in America was, well, then America may not have an outbreak, but that city might actually have an outbreak. Correct. So my argument is that it sounds, from what I recall of people who were giving hell to all the anti-vax people, the argument seems to be all or none. And so my argument has been, what if instead of saying, you know, vaccines work, which is objectively not an accurate statement, they generally work, they're generally safe, but they don't always work because there are people that get a vaccine and they still get the disease. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they still get the virus and it still causes havoc on their body. Um, so I said, well, what if instead we said, all right, the ones where we need like 90%, why don't we say, look, we understand if you don't want to get the flu vaccine, there's a lot more tolerance objectively, you know, through the numbers for people to not take it because we only need 34% of people to take it to prevent a huge outbreak. But we need 90 some percent, which is the, which is close to almost the entire population for the measles. So rather than say, you know, all or none vaccines work, you're just a, you know, you're anti-science rather say, look, we understand your hesitancy. Let's start with measles. Just, just work with us on the measles one. We understand that you don't want to get this one or this one, which are a little bit lower. It's still a bit risky, but it's not nearly as dangerous as this other one. This one is really important. So we prioritize based on that herd immunity threshold. Because what I think would happen in the long term is what people would get one vaccine, then maybe another, and they'd feel more comfortable about it. And they would be a little bit less hesitant. Because if you don't have any, chances are you're going to be hesitant or you're going to be skeptical of all of them. But if you've gotten one or two and nothing bad happened, you know, that, that, I mean, that's literally how life works. Like you do something once, something bad doesn't happen, you think, oh, I could do it again. And, you know, like, hey, I got drunk once and, you know, I didn't, I didn't drink and drive. I didn't do this. I didn't sleep around. I didn't do all. So, hey, you know what? Let me get drunk again. It's fun, right? Whatever. So what are your thoughts on that idea there? And, and, and where did I go wrong? You didn't really go wrong anywhere. I, the, the concept at the end, I, I really like where you say that, you know, one thing, it's kind of, we're, we're ingrained biologically that way. We, we performed an action and there wasn't a negative reaction. So we're not disinclined to do that action again. Um, but that there, that's where in lies critical thinking skills. Um, uh, that's why we're not an animal and we don't just follow base instinct because then we have to be critical about it. Well, I got lucky that I didn't cause an accident or get in trouble right. with the wall or hurt myself or others. Right. Uh, that wasn't a, a wise choice. Um, right. You know, that, that's where critical thinking comes in. And sure, if you sure, apply yeah. that to vaccines, like, and I tell people this all the time when it comes to medications, vaccines, I group it all together. I don't like to use even vaccines, plural, because they're all separate individual type things that they're, mm -hmm. they're tending to do. So each vaccine, um, I, I like to talk about it like that, you know, where it's, but anyhow, so far as herd immunity. Um, there's been a lot of people, like, as you mentioned, um, each, each virus has its own threshold. Mm -hmm. Not all viruses have a threshold. Um, some things, the common, think of the common cold, okay? Okay. Why do we not have herd immunity to the common cold? According to the, the logic that some, as redundant, sorry. According to the logic that some people use, that if everyone gets infected, um, we develop this immunity mm -hmm. or if it reaches a certain point so question is i asked them i said well what about the common cold right then you make them realize that sometimes things change too fast or their initial design is in such a way that our bodies don't develop a herd immunity too right okay okay now, herd immunity kept coming in. People keep talking about it with the coronavirus, even medical right. professionals, even groups and organizations. What kind of virus is the common cold? It's a coronavirus. All right. Okay. Herd immunity. I, I, I didn't know that. No, no. Herd immunity is most likely 
most likely not going to ever be possible uh, with SARS-CoV-2. It's not even an option. The virus changes too quick. And once again, our bodies are not built uh, to create or develop a lasting herd type immunity to a coronavirus. Okay. There's other viruses like that too. But whenever I see people mentioning that or thinking that that has any, anything to do with this, it's troublesome to me. And like you mentioned earlier, it's, it's harder for me to push back against that when it, you have groups right. like the CDC and uh, at times and you, you know, the FDA and the WHO making contradictory statements um, right, right now, herd immunity should even be uh, in the thought process for people with coronavirus right now, but as it relates, to, fair. but as it relates to other vaccines, uh, you, you said you want to have a logical conversation. We do know that measles, uh, you know, around 90 percent um, and you present that. And really, instead of thinking of it in, in government jurisdictions like country and state, don't think of it like that. Think of it in communities. That's where it'd be the okay. most. Okay. Um, you know, in your community, if. If 90 percent uh, of the community vaccinated for that, the, the transmission the mitigation of it is going to be down. Uh, you know, it's going to be successful. Uh, but, you know, you can theoretically have 90% of the country's been vaccinated to it. But if an entire state is not vaccinated, you're going to see an outbreak. Sure, uh, sure. You know, well, would it make the conversation easier is, is, I guess, what I'm getting at. If we, if, if and, and this is kind of a criticism of the professionals, the people that know better is, is that, the professionals or, or, or people that are in the know, the people that have the knowledge are, are, you know, whether it's just somebody who's very well read, it seems like they have kind of presented it as all or none. If you don't take, if, if you don't accept all of them um, or you make any argument that's, uh, that's ignorant, then I'm going to harass you and slam you for, for everything rather than just say, look, I get it. How about we start with one and, and just get somebody kind of warmed up to the one and say, look, I, you know what? Don't take these other ones. Fine. I get you. But this one's kind of important. And let me just let me just talk to you about this particular one. And then I feel like the next conversation that you might have or that that the the person who was unwilling to take the vaccine, they might be a little bit more receptive to future conversations about vaccines. And so when the next one, and I'm drawing a blank on any other ones other than measles and um, uh, I, rubella or whatever, mumps, whatever, yeah. you, know, you pick another one and you say, okay, you know, in the future, then they start, then they're faced with, you know, they've already had the measles vaccine. So later they're faced with another uh, vaccine and they're like, you know, their, their memory, I feel like is a lot more positive based on the one that, that they've actually had. And I feel like that sets the ground, the, the foundation for a future conversation, which is what this whole show does. This whole show is really based around the idea of how do we have tomorrow's conversation? Well, if, we, if today I'm slamming you for everything and I don't give you even an inch to work with, I guarantee that tomorrow's conversation is gonna be just as difficult. There's no, there's no you, you know, here's what's ironic. Um, you said, uh, when did we start, you know, grouping everything together? Okay. When, when did it become a zero sum mentality? Honestly, I think I noticed that it was about 12 years ago. It started happening mm -hmm. uh, and I started noticing it uh, on the, my, uh, in my professional associations. Okay. Uh, with pharmacy, as far as, far as pharmacy goes, there was, um, the state of Texas was really close to making, uh, the, um, yeah, sorry, I just lost it for a second. Uh, a, a vaccine mandatory, and it was the uh, Havarix. It was the um, HPV vaccine. Oh, uh, yep, yep, yep. Okay. It, it, was, it was like 2007, 2006, okay. 2008. There was a, and there was pushback in the medical community, and I, I was one of them, was like, no, you can't make this mandatory. The vaccine just came out. We don't know anything about it. And at right. that time, a lot of our associations were doing the same. Mm -hmm. Well, it got rejected. Okay. It's, it didn't, didn't become mandatory in Texas. Now it's still used to this day, but we know mm -hmm. that there's quite a bit of side effects to it. We do know there's a percentage of population. It will cause infertility. Okay. Um, 
Now, could you imagine making that mandatory for school children and something we know now causes infertility? Right. It would be a really bad. Um, we'd be looking at the consequences of it now because those school children would be young adults now who are being infertile. Right. Um, you know, and if Texas would have passed it, you probably would have seen other red states and then probably, other. you know, it amplifies in magnitude once you make something mandatory because now you've mandated those side effects on everybody. Right. So what happened is after that failed, then, then there was, uh, it seems to me like the anti-vax movement really kind of started pushing the people who were against all of it. Mm-hmm. Well, you started seeing that some in the medical community too. It was instead of being defensive about one or two, like, okay, we're going to defend the flu vaccine or the pneumonia vaccine or diphtheria or whatever, uh, right. but we're going to question the Havarix vaccine. No, it put us, it put a lot of them in a situation where they're going to defend all of them across the line. It was really okay. strange. And even in our conventions and conferences, you'll have speakers who literally will contradict each other. And uh, I, it's almost like around that time, probably around 2010 was the full completion. Oddly enough, one of the last little pushes that I had uh, Mm -hmm. that was pushing me into libertarianism and letting me realize the objectivity of politics the way it could be. Right. Because I approach medicine objectively. I don't practice medicine. I I study it. I'm a pharmacologist. Okay. So things have to prove out scientifically for me. Does this Mm -hmm. work? So I was taught in school, thank goodness, when I was still there to be objective and look at each thing individually. Right. You can apply that to politics. It's each thing individually too. But around 2010, the anti-vax movement caused this rift. So it was like, all of a sudden, we don't question our vaccines. We don't question our drugs. And then it kind of moved into the science versus anti-science camp. And it's almost straight down the political lines too, because you see it, whether if it's um, in environmental issues, Mm -hmm. medical issues, whatever the case may be. Um, certain objective data you can't have you can't discuss the gray you know what i'm saying it's it's got it's, right. it's black and white when it comes to vaccines it's the gray it's like are vaccines good or bad well i can't answer that it's gray because it depends upon each individual one right but now it's become a black and white everybody needs to be vaxxed and we've we've escaped um the objective you know gotcha view of it and uh i would say probably in a medical community that was around 2010 and it's grown on other subjects mm-hmm. over the past decade as um our medical sciences have become politicized if you will gotcha gotcha all right so we've established that we are not anti-vax i don't think that there's any reasonable description of anti-vax that would apply to either one of us no. uh, you know i now when it comes to the the COVID vaccination, I'm a little bit leery of it, not because I've read the science. I totally acknowledge that I have not read any of the research on the matter. I just simply apply as a lay person, a very consistent standard where I say, how long has this pharmaceutical been on the market? And what is my degree of risk that I, that, that I, that I can determine? And from what I can determine at my age and my particular health, which is pretty solid, uh, my risk is my risk is relatively low. And so therefore, I have looked at it and said, because I have a very low risk, because the drug, uh, I'm sorry, because the vaccine is relatively new, all of them are actually relatively new, even if they're based on prior research, which I do understand. Um, they're still they're still new, we're still working out, uh, you, you know, like we don't know the long term side effects to these, uh, if any. There, there may not be any, or there may be very, very few for very, very few people. Uh, but this is information that we don't know. So therefore, I am choosing for now to not take it. If in the future, um, maybe I, uh, you know, maybe I come down with uh, one of those particular diseases that makes me a little bit more at risk or simply old age, then, you know, I, I have to reassess and evaluate because uh, for me, pharmaceuticals, it's it's not always a never situation necessarily. It's a, what is my risk? What is the need for right now? Um, is that something that is generally considered acceptable in the medical community? Half and half. 
half and half. Um, <laughs> half and half. Um, that's, I, I, that's kind of what I thought you'd say, something like that. Specifically with uh, with the coronavirus. So now we've, we've established that we're not anti-vax. Right. So I, we're going to take a, a few moments here, I guess. We're going to talk about the coronavirus vaccines specifically. And then we'll talk about the passport, correct? Is that how you want yep, to do it? Yep, yep, okay. All right, so the coronavirus vaccines, I, I on my show, I've, I've covered it quite extensively, actually. And what I was okay. looking for was on one of my shows, I, um, I showed the inserts, because you had mentioned you, you got the insert of the Vioxx and you looked at it. Uh, and, and what I was trying to show you is I had an insert for the pneumonia, the flu, uh, flu shots, both of those pulled them out. They've got all kinds of information on them. The Moderna, right, right. the Moderna vaccine, it's inserts blank. <laughs> Like it's completely blank and it's on one, of my, but I can't find the insert. I was going to try to show that's it. Right. To, here's, that's right. See, that, that's the vaccine. that's completely blank. Um, so, okay. The two initial vaccines that come out uh, for the coronavirus, Moderna and, and the Pfizer, mm -hmm. they're both based off of a, a generally newer type of technology. It uses uh, MRNA technology where it uh, causes your uh, cells to produce the spike proteins uh, that your that the coronavirus has, so your immune system could recognize it. Okay, so it basically uses your body's power plant to produce parts of the virus, so your body can learn to attack it. Okay, so that, okay. that's a little, little bit different from before, where you inject antigens into the body and the body directly reacts to those and picks uh, picks up what's going on. That's why you see higher side effects on the second shot because. Um, the body is really starting to kick into overdrive and produce those uh, those spike proteins and your immune system is starting to react to it. And when your immune system reacts to anything, you, you get achy and you might have a fever and headache and those types of things. So back to the point, that type of technology has been studied in um, cancer vaccines uh, for a little over a decade. And as of yet, uh, they have not been, and keep in mind, these are small percentages of population that's been used in. Uh, and none of the vaccines have made it to market yet. Uh, they have not been effective enough and they have not been safe enough. Now I need to put an asterisk next to safe. Right. When someone has cancer, what is safe for them to take is not the same as if someone who is healthy and does not have cancer. Right. The risk versus benefit that is always present in the medical diagnosis of someone is different. Uh, if this is going to cause someone to, say, have eczema or perhaps uh, rheumatoid arthritis the rest of their life, those are, can be serious conditions. Uh, but if surviving cancer uh, is, you know, dying from cancer is the alternative, right. it's a pretty easy choice. Now, I mentioned those two autoimmune issues, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, psoriasis, for a very specific reason, because that's what happens, they found, whenever you cause use this mRNA tech to facilitate some sort of production in your cells, mm -hmm. an autoimmune disorder eventually develops in most of the clients. You take it. It's just a byproduct of manipulating the system. We haven't found a workaround yet. Gotcha. Now, both of these new vaccines will not, will, if they will cause these side effects, but you're not going to witness them for at least five, six, seven years. Gotcha. Well, these are things we already know. Um, so I, I've been against those vaccines since day one. So are um, you saying then that the um, that in probably eight to ten years, we should expect to see a higher um, incidence of autoimmune disorders, specifically skin and joints? Skin and joints, and there's there's a few other ones too. And uh, okay. with this being a little bit different, it might manifest itself a little bit differently with the immune system. Um, regardless, um, objectively, we're going to see some sort of heightened autoimmune issue uh, okay. develop over the next decade. Um, and there's there's even companies right now that's that's expanding research into autoimmune treatments and stuff. I mean, the market's already ex you know, the biotech market is already expecting this. Um, and gotcha. me saying this shouldn't be controversial, but it is. Right. Um, now, with that being said, the, let, let's just, I, I'm going to set those two vaccines aside for a moment. Uh, you have yeah. other vaccines. You've got uh, AstraZeneca's got a vaccine out and they've been having, um, it's here. Bad it's, PR time. 
bad PR time. And, and let me tell you, uh, it's warranted too. The vaccine's not very good. It causes a lot of spinal issues. Uh, it's gotten uh, all over the world. There's been there's been issues with it. Um, so I'm I'm not big onto that either. It's been rushed. Keep in mind for those of you who aren't aware of how long these things take, uh, vaccines, uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 years normally. And also for the record, just so everybody understands, coronavirus that we have this year is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-1 uh, came out uh, in 2003. Mm -hmm. They've been working on a vaccine for that for 18 years, 17 years, up to the point where uh, we got now. They still don't have a vaccine for it. So I, I just hi, hold that in your, your head for a minute. Right. I'm saying these things are rushed. And that's what AstraZeneca did. And now you have uh, Johnson & Johnson, who's probably the best vaccine on the market traditional sense i might i would consider getting it okay um, i would consider getting it. it it has had some issues but um it, it's types of side effects and stuff that it may have would be very short-lived right. um short-lived so let me of interrupt you here really quickly uh, hold your thought because i want to say something i think that is very very important we are having a discussion this is not medical advice so if you are watching even though Josh is a medical professional, he has not evaluated you. So therefore you need to have this conversation with your doctor. Okay, this would be the same for, uh, for, for anything that we're saying here. This is not intended any way to be medical advice. This is just us having a conversation because the conversation should be had. And we want to lay the groundwork and kind of progress in this conversation. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to interrupt and, and make that That's point abundantly clear. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, you know, um, now people come onto my show and they ask me specific questions and we we engage in a private conversation mm -hmm. and I have their background and everything. I, you know, I'll give you medical advice if, if you want, but I have sure. to know everything. This This is just a conversation. Absolutely. You know, but as far as me personally goes, I'm telling you objectively, the only vaccine I would consider getting is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, gotcha. And if people want more detail on the vaccines, on those two particular vaccines, they could go back and watch uh, a few of my shows where I've got like an hour and a half episode where I break it down and explain why. Right. Um, and they but, can reach out to you. They can find you out on Facebook yeah, or you know, whatnot I, you know, and reach and, out. And, and, and as always, anybody that doesn't know me, I, I do approach things in good faith. Um, right. So... Uh, but with that being said, okay, I've, we've established the concerns on the vaccines, and one of them would still do. Here's another thing, too. Uh, anytime a virus enters a population, it's mm -hmm. going to change and mutate, particularly at first. When it first gets a new host, it can change quickly, very quickly. Right. There's even a chance it could uh, explode into a population, make all kinds of people sick, and then die out on its own, even if it has a high R naught. Okay. Right. These, th these things can happen. Well, we're still early in. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 being in a new host. So the mutations are happening so quickly that a lot of these vaccines are becoming um, uh, ineffective. Mm -hmm. okay? So you're going to have to keep getting vaccinated. And especially if you're getting one that's uh, mRNA tech based, it has to be modified as well. And you'll have to get another one. Right. Which means that your cells that are already getting programmed to produce one spike protein will get program to produce another, which more than likely you're compounding your, there, there's no data on someone getting multiple mRNA vaccines, zero, right? Zero data on that. So like th that's got me highly concerned. Um, so people are, should expect uh, not, not just like a flu shot where you get shot, you know, injected once a year on this, it's probably going to be like two to three times a year. You're going to have to get vaccinated. Um, until this thing settles in a new host. Um, I mentioned on one of my videos, Moderna was already working on a booster vaccine. Uh, there's already about 10 generation two vaccines in the pipeline somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just laying it out there. I, what I'm saying is, because there's been people out there I've seen that like, oh, I get the shot, I'm done. I'm good. Right. Well, no, a lot of the people who, are, who got the shot, they're at risk right now. Uh, particularly you've got the, the Brazil variant that's here in the United States. Now it's all over. Uh, none of the vaccines we have in the United States currently are any more than 30% effective against that. Gotcha. So, you know, you got to scrutinize things 
objectively. So in a nutshell, DL, that's that's how I feel about the vaccines in general. There, there's okay. one I would consider now, but people need to have their eyes, realize that this is going to be something that's going to have to be repeated and repeated and repeated. Right. If that's the direction that they're wanting to go to protect themselves. Gotcha. And that leads into the next portion that we wanted to talk about, which is the vaccine passports. And I have quite a bit to say about this. And what's interesting is I've had, I, I've, you know, there's been a lot of question about the vaccine passports. And we especially had some questions uh, now that the Libertarian Party of Kentucky made their infamous tweet, uh, com- you know, making a comparison and drawing in the Holocaust, uh, specifically the yellow stars that are sewn, uh, that were sewn onto clothing for the Jewish population. We'll get to that after this particular portion. So right now we're going to talk about the the, the vaccine passports. And, uh, you know, Josh saw something that I posted recently out on Facebook. And so kind of let me go through it a little bit and just kind of give you some some background. So I, the idea of a vaccine passport, what that is, is basically if you if you remember the yellow cards, if you're old enough to, there, there used to be yellow cards and you get a vaccine and it would have the information like when you got it. Um, you know, I think it might have been uh, who gave it to you? I don't remember all the information. And then that would, you know, you, you, you might show that to the school and say, yep, my child has had all their vaccines. Here's here, here's basically the proof of it. So vac- vaccine passports are a little bit different. We started hearing about them a few months ago in terms of travel. Like, hey, you might have to have a vaccine passport in order to get on an airplane. And now we're starting to, and at the time, people started raising concerns and said, hey, wait a minute. You're going you're gonna to make this for like everyday life. And then people would say, ah, you're being alarmist. Well, here we are. We are actually starting to talk about that and have that conversation. So in New York, who is still fairly closed down, they have something that they're rolling out. It's called the Excelsior Pass. And what this will do is it's going to allow businesses to uh, utilize this pass and open up. Now, this is going to be mostly starting with larger venues so we're talking about things like a stadium or maybe a concert hall or or, or some other businesses where you're dealing with large numbers of people in the public and one of the pushbacks that i get from people is that hey wait a minute if you know if a business wants to um if a business wants to say hey we want to verify that you have a that you have a particular vaccine before we allow you into our establishment aren't they allowed to do that like don't you libertarians believe in like private property and the freedom of association? And the answer to that is absolutely we do. But and there's always a but that you have to consider. And my argument is saying that's fine in a free market, an actual free market. But when you have government involvement, it changes the relationship between an employer and an employee or a customer and a business. And what I mean by that is when the state of uh, uh, the state of New York has things closed and says, look, we're going to roll out this program. And if you want to be involved in this program, we'll let you open up early. What they're doing is they're tying economic activities. It's, it's kind of like a soft requirement for vaccination. They're tying this economic activity to a particular behavior. And they're saying, look, look, if you, Mr. Business, want to open up, um, early, you know, you know, we might let you open up in uh, next year, but if you want to open up this year, uh, you know, you can do so if you get involved in this particular program. And then in or- and, and then once they do, once they agree to that, then what you have is you have uh, people that want to go in and maybe engage in that business, they would have to now also engage in the program and potentially employees who want to remain employed, they might also have to participate in this program. All part of the state of uh, New York, I keep wanting to say Florida, the state of New York opening up and and saying like, look, we're gonna allow you to do business. So this is changing how this is done. And one of the points that I made is that it does two things. It dictates uh, the the relationship between employee, employer, customer, and business, uh, because it ties that proof of some level of health to doing business. So mm-hmm. it's not really a business saying on their own free will, saying we want to offer um, 
a, a, a particular type of environment to our customers and our employees. And in doing so, we're going to make this particular requirement. Um, so, so now they're backed up by the government because if they had to do that on their own, then what could happen is people could say, well, I don't want to work there. Um, and, and customers could say, well, I don't want to do business with you. And, and technically they can still, however, when this, again, when the state is, is saying you can't open early unless you engage in this particular program, it's very possible that later they could just simply say, you can't open at all until you engage, engage in this program. So the, the, the state is really interfering with that relationship. They're also interfering with the program. Now this program is called Excelsior uh, Pass and it's developed by IBM or IBM has some hand in it. I'm not entirely certain of the relationship there. Whenever you have a product that somebody wants to bring out to the market, you have a certain amount of risk. I come up with an idea and I say, man, I think this is going to be a really great idea. And so then I go out and maybe I do a test run and I get some positive feedback and I say, this is, this is definitely great. So I go out and I find some investors and I say, all right, I got this great idea. Here's my pitch. You know, I go on the shark tank, what have you. And somebody gives me a whole bunch of money uh, for, you know, some stake in the company or some percentage back or what have you. And what ends up happening is now is there's this identification of the risk that's involved with this idea. Well, when, again, when the government is determining that when they're basically driving the demand for this particular product, it's reducing the risk of development. So in this particular case, the Excelsior Pass, the risk for development of the Excelsior Pass is reduced. So it almost offers a somewhat guaranteed return on investment. Because the government is basically saying, like, if you want to open up early, then you have to use this uh, particular program. And here's the particular app that we have determined uh, that we're going to particularly support. And if you go to, if you go online and you research, you'll find out that the website is a .gov. So it is a government run website where you can go and either sign up to participate as a business or sign up to participate as a regular individual. And so therefore what you've got is this is not the market deciding because if the market was deciding, it would look more like Apple Pay or Google Pay. And Apple and Google Pay have been around now for about six years. And think about how those operate. You may or may not be participating with either one of those. And yet you can still go to any business you want and you can use your regular credit card. And in many cases, you can still use cash. So the, these, these uh, ideas are out there for Google Pay, for Apple Pay. However, uh, they're not required. And if you choose not to use them, it is not necessary for regular everyday social engagements. So I'm going to stop there on my uh, on my bloviating on this. There's a lot more. And let's, let's, let's see what Josh has to say about this. Um, you, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, we don't have a free market. OK, now, if and, and that's important because obviously believing in private property rights. Right. You and I both do. If if a business owner wants to require whatever, I don't care if it's a, a vaccine, if they you got to wear a, you know, a jacket when you come into the establishment, um, the business owner has the right to determine if it's their private property, you know, what kind of voluntary associations they have. Right. It's right. a tent of libertarianism. However, what you see happening in New York, that, that's, that's not free market. Um, right. You have basically a contingency upon a right. Mm -hmm. So they're putting a contingency on your freedom of association. They're putting a contingency on, because um, yeah, I will translate this over to the people because you're saying the places I could go, the merchants, the businesses, the venues, mm -hmm. they can't be open unless they're held to a contingency. They get this right. app and they follow these guidelines. Well, that means you're holding me to that contingency too, because I'm the consumer of that uh, merchant. Right. So the way I see it, that's not a free market. You're putting a contingency upon someone's freedom of travel, freedom of association. And you're also putting economic contingencies on people that shouldn't exist. Um, if this all should be left to the, to the, to the market completely, um, mm -hmm. The way I see that this does is this just intertwines the government with the economy a little bit more than it already is. Right. It's one aspect of this that I have an issue with. Um, uh, but anyhow, like, like you said, I completely agree with you. It's not a free market. 
And uh, so our libertarian argument uh, that they have property rights mm -hmm. is not applicable because this is a contingency in New York being placed upon a right. Right. You know, th those businesses, you could say they voluntarily chose to do it. But, you know, that's kind of uh, that's kind of this is called blackmail. If someone gets blackmailed, you don't say they consented, do you? Right. You know, this is not a voluntary thing these people in New York are having to do. Not now, granted, there's probably a few of them that are more than happy to, to have pro, you know, only vaccinated people into their businesses. And if that's what they personally choose, that's fine. But if, if we think in general that this is a consent based voluntary free market move, it's, it's not. It's right. Not. No. All right. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Awesome. So, so now that we've established that it's not really a free market, what are some other potential problems with it? And this, I think, is where the, the libertarian um, view of, uh, of the free market really comes into play. So, and this has been reported by the New York Times, Scientific American, and other places, is that vac uh, these vaccine passports have the capability to eat and it's, and it's not a it's not a far-fetched capability where like th there really actually are some serious concerns that it could disproportionately um widen the gap between basically the haves and the have-nots and that can occur on two levels the first level is within any particular given locale like say a country or a state but then also between different countries and when you there, there's a particular uh, I'll, I'll I'll put it in the show notes, but there's a particular New York Times article that's really, really good and kind of goes into this. And they talk about and they say, look, the reality is that if you're tying economic activity to getting the vaccine, the reality is and, and, we, and there's already been arguments about this is that vaccines tend to be easier, more easily attained or acquired by people that have more means. So therefore, basically, the poor people that don't have the level of access that the rich people have might be limited on regular everyday activities. And so that is a huge problem. Telling them that they may not be able to go to a ball game that they otherwise you know, would be able to go to because they may have trouble getting a vaccine. The other issue is between rich and poor countries. And I believe it was the New York Times again that pointed this out and said that basically rich countries get vaccines and you know new medicines first period so therefore if you're tying some of these activities to it um and, and one of the arguments that they made is that some people do need to travel particularly in europe to maybe a different country in order for work uh, for work very similar to how some americans might travel across a different state for for their job and so if you're tying travel to having a vaccine you're not as able to get it or if you're tying um, you know, work or other things to having this vaccine, then you can easily very quickly kind of widen that chasm that we already have between the haves and the have nots. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and hear what thoughts that Josh may have on this. Versus, um, well, here's the thing, what, you are ha what you're talking about is, is very important. This would definitely highlight um, the differences between the have and have nots and it'll mm -hmm. grow that gap wider that new york times article was was accurate so some you know what they have going on in the eu with that green digital mm -hmm. uh pass um the same type of thing barrier to economic entry you know you have to have this and that and you know what if you don't have the means or capability that is all true mm -hmm. okay but i i see us that's not even the primary discussion i want to have because if that's at the forefront, what policymakers will try to address is the inequality in that infrastructure. Right. Now, you're probably like, what, what, Josh? That sounds really cold. Just hear me out for a second. Okay, so you address the inequality and you get everybody on board. You, you redistribute vaccines or whatnot. That, that's great. Great. Let me set all of that in a box. It's important. Let me put it in a box and set it aside. Mm -hmm. Let's step back and let's talk about the passport before we dive too far into it. All of a sudden, we're talking about a vaccine passport to do something. Let me ask you this. Why coronavirus? I don't know. It's a good question. 
That is a very good question because I can sit here and think of at least 15 to 20 other ailments that should be, if we're going by objective data alone, mm -hmm. that should be on a passport, immunized passport long before coronavirus. Gotcha. This hasn't even been, this hasn't even been discussed as even been something that should be uh, broached. This is always like a no-go territory for policymakers until now for something that is not even near a, a top tier uh, international problem. And you're probably like, Josh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Okay, fine, fine. What are you going to add to it? Where is your new level? We have created such a low standard. Mm -hmm. um, like, okay, coronavirus. Now, I understand in a lot of countries, you do have to have certain vaccines to enter. Okay. Like, like you know, th that's there. But yeah. what else is going to be added to this? Right. You've set such a low standard. It will be easy, easy for any policymaker to anywhere to add the argument on top of it. Because like I said, there's already 20 things I could think of that should be mandatory on a vaccine passport first. Gotcha. Okay? Um, it'll be easy for them to say, okay, the next swine flu, everybody's got to have the swine flu vaccine. Right. And you already mentioned some of the regulatory capture that was going, in, going on with New York and IBM. What do you think is happening between these drug companies and our government? Right. How do you think these drugs got through so fast? It's regulatory right. capture. It's not because Trump waved a magic wand. Right. Certain companies got contracts. Other ones got shut out. Right. right. It's going to work the same way with what other drugs need to be on this mandatory passport. Right. Right. So you got to back up a second. What is our entry level here? Our entry level now is coronavirus one. If entry level that low, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now during H1N1 outbreak, that would have been mandatory. Mm -hmm. Now, who's going to make money off of this? Right. Yeah. Uh, the, big, you know, the big companies that are producing the vaccines. And now it's going to be mandatory. So now, once again, remember I, I mentioned earlier about the Havrix vaccine, making it mandatory without right. much data. Right. Well, okay. Say you make all these vaccines mandatory right out the gate. Okay, we got this new virus going around. We got these companies. So each time are we going to allow companies to produce a vaccine in five months and then mandate it on the population? Right. I mean, are we really prepared for mandating side effects on people? Right. Because that's, I mean, and at that point in time, is the government going to be culpable? In 10 right. years, is the federal government going to be paying for all these people's treatments who have right. auto issues? Yeah. And, no, you know, but they're, they're not DL. Right. Because they've no, no, they're not of liability. Right. They have. So, and, and that's what we're looking at. And, and Absolutely. Like, it, it is. Before we even move on to the economic aspect of the passport, mm -hmm. there's two sides of it. There's there's the side of what can be added to it. And mm -hmm. two, like you said, they've been working on these programs for a while. I don't think most people understand what a the capacity of a vaccine passport means. It means mm -hmm. centralizing your health care data. Right. All right. It means centralizing your healthcare data digitally. It means connecting us digitally. Now, in one aspect, you can think, oh, that's great if I can keep my medical profile centralized. Do you realize that a vaccine passport completely exonerates anybody from HIPAA violations? Right. And, and I've got a point to make on that here in just a moment, I think. Uh, but I want to back up real quick on something that you were kind of pointing out and you were saying like, hey, this could be expanded. And I think this is the difference between a free market approach and a government backed approach. And that is that um, uh, that when you've got something that's in the free market, the nature of the free market is that good ideas will flourish because you have this ebb and flow of people making decisions. And so if it's a good idea, then a lot of customers will make it and then a lot of businesses will make it. The nature of government is that ideas expand in scope. And it may sound, again, a lot of this sounds alarmist when you raise the concern early on, but let's take a little bit, let's walk through history a little bit. We, we can just use one quick example because I think a lot of people would remember this. A long time ago, like, two, three years ago, maybe somewhere around there, Mark Zuckerberg was brought before Congress. And one of the funny things that was being uh, passed around on the internet was this clip of him talking about WhatsApp with one of the senators. And I don't remember which senator it was, but the senator asked him, they said, you know, Mr. Zuckerberg, 
if, and I, I believe they used black power as an example. They said, if uh, I'm communicating with somebody on WhatsApp and I'm talking about black power, am I going to receive related advertisements to black power, to anything related to that? And Mark Zuckerberg said, sir, it's encrypted. You know, we can't see that information. We don't have access to it. And then the, the senator again was like, okay, okay. But what I'm saying is, let's say I'm having a conversation with somebody. And he repeated himself. I mean, he repeated the exact same scenario. Uh, there was no difference in his follow-up question. It was the exact one. He just basically repeated himself and said, hey, you know, is, is this possible? And then you could see it on Mark Zuckerberg's face that he was kind of dumbfounded, like, okay, how do I tell this guy the same thing any more clear? And, and the problem when you have this government expansion, when we're talking about like, say, the government saying, okay, um, now you got to have this vaccine, now you got to have that vaccine, now you got to have this vaccine, is that government frequently makes decisions that they do not belong making because the people making them do not understand the gravity of the decision they're making. Uh, you know, and this is, and then that was a good example because you, they're talking about regulating and it's like, you don't even know you, you, you're trying to regulate in tech and you don't even understand how the tech works. The mm -hmm. same goes for medical. If you know, they're going to, you know, it's not unreasonable for government to come along in the future and say, well, we think you should have this vaccine because the government doesn't have to follow the old rule that everybody on the internet follows, which is, well, they don't really follow, but they, they argue and they say, are you an expert? Right? Hey, if I get on there and I start talking about vaccines, first thing someone's gonna ask, are you an expert? Are you an immunologist? But the, we don't ask that of our government. We don't say, hey, are you an immunologist? When they're when Congress is, you know, dragging people before them asking them crazy ass questions. Yeah, I, you know, I, my grandfather, when I was a kid, and he was a very educated man, he, he used to always say every time somebody would come on the news, and they would claim themselves an expert he would always shudder he hated right. that. he hated that word and because of that i like to think that never call yourself an expert right <laughs> on anything you know right. I, I i know a little bit i try to know a little bit more and i know now yeah try, try to approach things from not such a narcissistic standpoint oh like I'm yeah an expert, I, know, I know best uh because not everybody who has letters after their name or whatever are being altruistic or even know what they're talking about uh, evidence by people in government who are just mouthpieces, you know, like right. Dr. Fa Dr. Fauci is a good example for one, uh, you know, so what someone says, just because the government says, like you said, if they were all medical professionals and they were all being altruistic, maybe I would listen to them. Right. What the point is, is you got people, I, I never forget my first trip uh, to Tallahassee in the state capital. And I was like, and I was talking to all these people about these healthcare policies. And I'm talking to a guy who was a funeral director, another lady who was a real estate agent, and another lady who was a teacher. And they're sitting there questioning my understanding of chemistry. And I right. just found it ironic because I'm like, these people are so narcissistic that they think because they're sitting in this seat, all of a sudden they understand something that they don't. Right. I think for some reason, I'm wanting to say that that was Chuck Grassley uh, talking to uh, Zuckerberg. He, he was at whatever it was, it was questions that were like, I understand if you're worried about privacy, but the, the right, question right. was like really basic. Yep. And, and I, I'll be honest with you, like I, I wasn't so sure it was basic. I'm not because that's not something I'm not an IT guy, right? I got to right, ask, a, right. I gotta ask a lot of questions. Um, I mean, I understood the concern, but like, and I do have concerns about Facebook and Zuckerberg, but on that one yeah. thing, I kind of felt for the guy. I was like, what's he supposed to say here? I mean, right. You know, yeah. we don't have access to that. That's, that's encrypted, yeah. you know? but um, I, I don't know. It's just, and it's not a, and it's not always even just ignorance. I mean, experts disagree with experts all the time. You oh, mentioned yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Dr. Fauci a moment ago. Now, Dr. Fauci has many years in government. And, uh, I, you know, my understanding is that he is a trained doctor and he, uh, I don't know if he's actually an epidemiologist or immunologist or exactly what he studied exactly, but I know he's up there in credentials with being, with having studied. But there are other doctors who are of equal or maybe even slightly greater credentials. Um, one comes to mind, Dr. Ioannidis, I believe is how, how you say his name. He has disagreed with some of the immunologists, epidemiologists, and he himself is, I believe, an epidemiologist. 
and has put out a lot of great work and has a great reputation in the field of epidemiology and medicine. And he has disagreed with some things, uh, some major points. And mm -hmm. I think a long time ago, last sometime in the middle of last year, he was raising the flag and saying, look, I think that we should remain open and deal with the higher risk populations, the ones that we currently know are higher risk, right? So there, I mean, it, it could just be that this particular person is well-intentioned, very intelligent, knows their stuff, and still happens to be wrong because for whatever reason, maybe they miss something in the data, maybe they're coming yeah. from a different perspective, and this person over here, they may be right, uh, or they mo might both be wrong, and through that argument, through that debate, they, they find out where they're both wrong and they come to a proper conclusion. No, so, I, look, so, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. No, 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 I, like I, I know many epidemiologists and several immunologists who disagree with Dr. Fauci that I know personally. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to, I wasn't trying to, what I was really kind of saying is the title is used for validity because yeah. he's an expert. Yeah. Right. And while he, the man has a lot of titles and he's done some great things in his life. Yeah. He is, he's a, he's a mouthpiece. Okay. Right. Like, that's among, his role, his position. That's his role. Um, among mo it's kind of like the Surgeon General. It's a quasi-political position. Right. Uh, you know, th they use the credentials to give validity to what they're saying. It doesn't mean right. that that's the thing. One of the first things, if you're trying to take over the mindset of a population, is you get the uh, the intellectual community. That's why mm -hmm. our, our universities are being attacked. Um but you also get people in those positions who are respected, quote unquote. Right now, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like the type of intellectual debate on the coronavirus that needs to be happening needs to be happening with doctors like the one that you mentioned, uh, not mm -hmm. with political pieces like Fauci. I, I was just pointing that out as a mouthpiece. Right. And I want to make sure that people didn't misunderstand and think that we're, you know, discrediting him as a medical professional entirely, I think we just have to put things into proper perspective and say, okay, one, what is this person's particular role? He is not on a day-to-day, -day, as far as I know, doing the actual research. Now, he may be reading the results of the research. Okay. Um, I, I will right? go as far as like, I, I'm not discrediting the fact that he has a degree. Right. I will discredit the fact that he's a valid mouthpiece for coronavirus. I will, I, I will say that, that say it on, I'll say it on my show. That's fair enough. He's not in the right position. I'll yeah. let the medical professionals argue about. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to the medical professionals. I, to have I, that I'm argument. not. I'm not shy about that DL. That, that's, that's fair. Pretty, you know. That's <laughs> so, so so let's move on to the last point about this vaccination passport, this vaccine passport, right? So here is the part that I think is really really critical. So um, if you go to the Excelsior Passport website, which is a government based website, you're going to find on there that it says that you know they're not collecting personal health data. Now, I don't know exactly how this works. So let's just assume that this is true, that, that the Excelsior app itself is not collecting data, that maybe I go to a health professional and they scan something in or they send a message to my system, uh, you know, to, 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 my, uh, to the system saying, hey, this person has been vaccinated. And then the Excelsior app, let's just assume for the moment that all it does is say, DL, if I'm involved in it, DL got vaccinated on April 1st, not a fool's joke, not, a, not an April fool's joke, right? So <laughs> assuming that personal health data is not stored with this IBM application, that still doesn't mean that sensitive data is not there because you have what's called metadata. So the metadata can be things like the date that the app was installed, whether or not it's actually on the phone, the proof of your vaccination, the date the proof was acquired, possibly geolocation, um, and then date and location of any time that the proof was presented. So if I go to a particular business and I scan it, then that information may get collected and stored somewhere, so on and so forth. The question is, what will the future use of this information be like? Well, we don't know. When it comes to best case scenarios, you really don't need to spend a whole lot of attention to them because they're the best case scenario. It's the worst case scenarios that you want to evaluate and identify and say, what is the degree of risk? Well, think of it this way. At least twice now, news reports have shown maps of cell phone tracking. You've seen the maps. It's like a little map of the U.S. and you've got lines all over it. And they're like, ah, oh, we can see where we can track where cell phones ha ha have been moving. 
And if you remember, this was done at least twice now with the Florida Spring Breakers. They did it once last year, and they did it again once this year. So we know that movement of phones can be tracked. Now imagine that you have this passport, this app, this vaccine um, passport on your phone, and it is also saying, you know, sending regular signals and saying, hey, this person is here now. Hey, you know, or this phone, not person per se, but this phone is here. So then what you can do is you can take these two different tracking. You can say, all right, Here's the tracking of all the cell phones we know. Here's the tracking of all the information um, that comes from the installed version of this vaccine passport. And then you can compare the two and then you can identify which phones do not have this vaccine app, uh, application. And that narrows down to a degree uh, the, the, the people that might not be vaccinated, particularly if you know if you have other information that says the majority of the people that are getting vaccine are using the passport. Well, then you know that there's very few people that are using, say, a paper version, which you can print out. Um, so I bring, I bring that up because if you remember back in 1942, just 80 years ago, uh, the census, the 1940 census was used to round up Japanese for internment. And it may sound a bit alarmist. Again, this, you know, the further you are away from an atrocity, the more alarmist it sounds. The closer you are to an atrocity, the more difficult it is to stop. This is just unfortunately a natural reality. Mm -hmm. So Pasco County here in Florida was utilizing this targeted intelligence program where they would take certain information that they had available and they were using it to try to identify people that would most likely break the law and they harassed nearly a thousand citizens okay so the point that i'm making here is that vaccine passports they may be a neat idea and they may have real value in a free market a real free market but they're not a free market driven idea rather they are driven by the same entity that's government whether you're talking local state or national it's the same entity that continues to abuse information and has a long history of abusing information, uh, taking that information that they have acquired in some way and uh, using it to abuse the citizens of the country. The fox is guarding the hen house. So Josh. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just wanna add one little thing here. I think absolutely. a lot of people, people don't understand what already transpires in our system. Now, I, I'm not condoning that lady here in Florida who worked for the Department of Health who was trying to whistleblow some stuff and did some mm -hmm. funny stuff. You know, I, I'm not. Well, that's the one that had the uh, SWAT team break into her house. Yeah, 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 there was some odd stuff there. But let me let me point this out. What people don't realize when you get a vaccine here in Florida and most states are like this, it gets reported to a system called Florida Shots. Mm -hmm. um, they can take that information and ping it off your cell phone and they can already track who has or hasn't been vaccinated in the state. OK, so the capability that they're doing already um, already is is nefarious and, right. and can be it doesn't have to be public for it to be bad. You said like you, when you're in the middle of a, an atrocity, it's already too late. Are they going to tell you when one's happening, DL? Right, right. Is it going to be announced on the news? I mean, we, we are in the middle of a collapse right now. I mean, look around. I mean, you know, so it's like things are happening. They're, they're already happening. They're transpiring right. right in front of everybody. And now we're talking about moving things out in the open. Right. Um, we're talking about metadata and how much information can be transmitted and how much information can be taken. We are being linked like every bit of data about us, our social security number, our financial records, everything can be linked uh, mm -hmm. so quickly anymore with these algorithms, these artificial intelligent algorithms that they run. And I think that's what they used over in Pasco County, wasn't it? An AI algorithm that determined- uh, I'm not, who was I'm most not entirely certain of the details, but I know that they, they cobbled together a bunch of information and then used it um, to determine who they should harass. It's, it's very minority report, right? And, right, uh, very much. The, the artificial intelligent uh, program, Deep Blue. Uh, uh, no, I've heard of that one. Okay, yeah, they, they were able to use it to run, to do predictive algorithms based upon uh, people's behaviors, their mannerisms, right. and when they're likely to do all these types of things. They don't have to ask your permission for this data already. They can collect all right. this everywhere through back doors. You mentioned we don't have a free market. No, we right. don't have 
free market says Excelsior uh, absolutely uh, beholden to uh, HIPAA. No, guess what? When you sign into the app, you disclose your th that authority to them. Right. So whoever they do business with, they can disclose it to them now too. It's it's right. not it's not they're not a gatekeeper for you. They're not held under HIPAA. Once you've given them that permission, so now all of a sudden, whether if they use a, a centralized blockchain or some sort of a ledger format, however they do right. it. Once that data, like groups like Florida Shots get tied into Excelsior and programs like that, you know, what other kind of information you could find off of Florida Shots? A whole lot. Any of you, anything that's been built under your insurance it becomes all right. tied together. So now, like I talked before, you have a centralized healthcare profile mm -hmm. that's going to come with you everywhere. And unless you've got it somehow super encrypted on a blockchain or something, and even people that's got that, like the ledgers and uh, devices they carry their crypto on, it could still be hacked. Right. Somebody could come right back, come right to you and just access your data, right. everything about you just off of your phone or, or maybe it's a nefarious merchant who starts selling it. You thought you thought credit card uh, fraud was bad before. Wait, wait till they know absolutely everything about you. Right. Let me read something. This is a very quick um, excerpt from this book called They Thought They Were Free, The Germans, 1933 to 45. Um, this is a, a book that was published and it kind of goes into, um, you know, some of the details that, of, of things that led up to the problems that uh, that we saw, the atrocities that we saw happen. So here's this excerpt really quick. And it's, uh, the book, uh, by the way, is written by uh, Milton Mayer. I haven't read the whole thing. I've just read some, you know, some significant portions of it that have been published online. It was pretty interesting. But this one little clip, I think, goes to what you were saying what we've both been saying where, hey, uh, you know, a, a lot of these atrocities, they, they, they don't tell you that they're going to happen. So here it goes. It says, but the one great shocking occasion when tens or hundreds or thousands will join with you never comes. That's the difficulty. If the last and worst act of the whole regime had come immediately after the first and smallest, so imagine the worst thing that could possibly happen came directly after the most minor thing that was no big deal. Thousands, yes, millions would have been sufficiently shocked if, let us say, the gassing of the Jews in 43 had come immediately after the, quote, German firm stickers on the windows of non-Jewish shops in 1933. But of course, this isn't the way it happens. In between come all the hundreds of little steps, some of them imperceptible, each of them preparing you not to be shocked by the next. And I think this is the key point and leads us to that infamous Libertarian Party of Kentucky tweet that created a hellstorm. Mm -hmm. Finally, Libertarian, I saw it at one point, Libertarians was tweeting, uh, was um, uh, trending. Trending, trending, on Twitter. Uh, trending on Twitter, get my tongue tied there, trending on Twitter at number six at one point because of this particular tweet. So here's what they had to say. Um, this tweet just said, are the vaccine passports going to be yellow, shaped like a star and sewn on our clothes? That's it. And boy, did it raise a hellfire storm. Oh, yeah. Even got the wrath of our party chair. Uh, yeah, wrath of our party chair, wrath of the um, the the uh, former chair. Uh, you know, and, and and there were several news articles about it. You had I, I saw some articles that um, had reached out to uh, some rabbis for their thoughts on the matter, particularly uh, in particular a rabbi from Kentucky. Um, I don't know his particular position, um, but I think the most interesting thing about that whole conversation was that people were saying, "Hey, that's offensive." And it was really interesting that people said that it was offensive because I was like, okay, what, what makes it offensive? And they said, well, you're trivializing the, the Holocaust. And I said, well, are they? Because there's a, I saw an article somewhere and it said, basically pointed out that Americans disagree on practically everything. But the one thing that most people, like most people agree, is that Hitler was terrible. He was an evil person. And virtually mm -hmm. everything that happened was terrible. 
right? Like, I think the only credit that we get is like the, the national roadway system, the interstate system, right? Like, I think that was something that kind of was developed during Nazi Germany to help them move their tanks around, you know, but outside of that, like nobody gives the, 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 the Nazi regime credit for much of anything other than being a horrible, absolutely despicable reg mm -hmm. regime. And yeah. in fact, nobody wants to be compared to Hitler. And I think that's the reason why Godwin's law it can be so, you know, it is what it is in, 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 in this, this Hitler um, denunciations can be so powerful. Because if I say, well, dude, I can't believe that you're basically like Hitler. Nobody wants to be like Hitler. And nobody really, at that point, nobody really wants to be put into a position to have to defend themselves. So I, I find it very odd that we say, hey, that's offensive because it trivializes. Because to me, what, what, what I saw was, was two things. One, Hitler's bad. It's, anything associated with Hitler was bad. And this, similar to, you know, this um, takes us on the same path that the Germans were on once upon a time before the regime was in place. And therefore, we want to we want to raise the alarm so that we don't end up getting there. So to me, it was kind of weird to say that it was offensive. Now, was it poorly worded? Could it, you know, it, it, you know, it is, it is a matter of communication. I think there's a fair argument there to say that it was poorly worded. Um, you know, maybe they should have known better to say, OK, you may, the analogy may be a, a correct analogy, but people are so they, they, they react so quickly to it that your message is going to get lost bef long before it ever reaches the odd the intended audience so so there's an argument there in the communication uh but it was very interesting to see how things played out what are your thoughts it's it's complex mm -hmm. <laughs> you know um first and foremost let's talk about history for a minute right we why are we not allowed to objectively analyze history right well, you said everything we know of about hitler is bad and it's evil and well, everything we think about, right? Uh, that we have a general, maybe, not, thought, every, obviously. Well, maybe you know, not everything we know exactly, but you know. Well, hold on, but that does not mean we can't learn something. Okay? Right, right. Now, any, anybody who listens to me or watches any of my shows, nobody's going to confuse me with someone who's hateful, who wants to hurt a bunch of people or anything right. like that. So I say that before I mention this book, uh, the Mein Kampf, right? Hitler's book. Right. The man was brilliant, okay? He was evil. He was brilliant, but you have to understand you have to understand the causes of of his the evil acts that he he perpetrated. You have to understand how he was thinking. You have to understand mm -hmm. how he got his community, his his country to think. Okay? Right. Um, there's a, another important book by uh, Kenneth Burke. It's called Rhetoric. Right. OK. Now, political rhetoric is is very dangerous and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very useful. You can manipulate large groups of people that way. And you know, it started very slow with the, the Jews. Okay. Obviously they didn't, just like you said, they didn't go right into uh, putting people in camps. Uh, people would have been shocked. So what they did is they manipulated society through political rhetoric through these different stages. Right. Right. And you can study that throughout history and you can see what these stages are. And, and it's talked about very clear in Hitler's writings of, of what he was doing and how he was manipulating the masses and how he got people pushed into this division where they would look at another person as if they were unhuman, right? Right. So th that's what you have to do. You have to separate the human element um, in a population to get one side of the population to look at the other as if they're not human. You have to dehumanize your opposition. Right. Okay? right. We're seeing a lot of Mein Kampf in our political rhetoric these days right. from both major parties almost word for word a lot of right. time okay um so what we have is with this passport yes it does look like the early stages of division and of separation and you and i just talked about the potential intrusion and infringement that these passports mm -hmm. can have right so while i do find it absolutely an accurate statement um unlike our chair and previous chair said it is accurate historically context okay right. it's in is it in poor taste perhaps yeah you know right that, that's subjective i can't tell you or a rabbi in kentucky how to feel about it i can't right 
But what I can tell you is history is for all of us, not just the Jews who have who went through the Holocaust, whose mm -hmm. people, friends of mine, whose relatives went through the Holocaust. We right. all we all need to safeguard against that again. Right. All together. You know, I, I, I like I said to the chair, the previous chair. I will stand against any road that gets built that leads in this direction. Right. If, if you want me to segregate any American out to inhibit their rights, their freedom of travel, to box them in, I don't care why. The answer is no. That's not the place for the government. So any road that the government builds to box us in will lead eventually to a box car. That, right. is, the, that is the end point to all of this. So me saying that, if that offends you, I'm sorry, but I'm not right. sorry. I'm not sorry. Right. Yeah, I, no, care, I agree. I care about you. I don't want anybody, anybody right. being treated that way. And if you're building roads, if you're building roads that can be abused, and like, I don't want people to say a slippery slope. Look, 30 years ago, if you would tell the general public half the things that are in the Patriot Act, they would violently riot. And here right. we are 30 years later, people acquiesce to it. So you tell me a vaccine passport's no big deal. Five right. years from now, what's it going to do? They're yeah. going to determine your income. They go, are they going to tie that into with your uh, your UBI? Are they going to tie that into your digital dollar card? Right. What I mean, you sit there and be like, oh, they won't do I mean, that. that, you know, that that's that's stuff, a great point. Because that's what they uh, were saying in 98 about stuff that the uh, Patriot Act, you know, with the domestic surveillance has made commonplace. We right. got a guy, we got a guy still hiding in an embassy across seas from our government because he pointed out they were violating our constitution. Nobody right. And if people that. if people remember, you and I had a um in a previous episode we did a bill review and I believe it was on the bill review for uh in Kentucky, the one that was going to make uh, insulting an officer illegal. Yeah. And in there it tied it said, look, if you insult an officer, if you say mean things to him while out you could lose your um, benefits for a time, your welfare for a time. So if you're on welfare and you go out to a protest and the officer says, hey, I need everybody to move. And then you start yelling at him. And you say, you dirty pig. I can't. I, I This is my right to blah, blah, blah. You know, and then you say some mean things to him. You could possibly uh, be violating the law and lose some of your economic uh, benefits. So this stuff, it, it's not, we're not even just making it up. I mean, in some ways, yes, we are kind of theorizing where it might go because maybe the vaccine passport will never lead to uh, a situation again, like Germany. Maybe it is, in fact, maybe a situation like Germany will never happen again. We I don't, don't think it, know I don't, that. I don't think it has to. And somebody I'm going to talk to really soon, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I get to feel a little bit better, uh, Harrison Kemp, uh, he okay. wrote an excellent book called a paradise, uh, excuse me, a parasite's paradise. Yeah. Um, his, his, con the other night. his concept, um, that basically we've <coughs> extended our prison walls. Mm -hmm. We don't need to build concentration camps. We don't need to build right. those things. The whole right. damn thing is, you know, we're, we're in it, right. you know, it's the modernized version of control and domestication. Right. Now that's a whole other topic right there. It but is, it is, yeah. you know, tyranny is not going to look the same. If we would set pri prior to, to Hitler's time, you know, we'd be worried about tyranny. What, what are we going to be looking back at the, you know, the turn of the century? Are we going to look back at the mid 1800s? What, what's our frame of reference? It's not right. the same. Yeah. That's why you have to study the context of history. You have to know why, not what. Right. The next, I mean, we talk about the next Holocaust. We've got it going on right now in China. And nobody wants to talk about with the right. Muslim ethnicities that are literally, literally getting killed and castrated and everything else. What is there's the over, camps. There's over a million of them down there. Right. <laughs> and here we are in America, the party of Liberty and our party chairs complaining about a tweet that might be inflammatory. Dude, right. there literally are people sitting millions of people in camps right now. Right. We're talking about a passport that's going to control freedom of movement. Right. I, I mean, my mind was blown. Like I, the more I sit here and think about it, it kind of aggravates me because I'm like, how can we sound like conspiracy theorists anymore? Whenever you and I right. on here talked about what's going on in Kentucky, you know, they're tying this to economic economics, you know, penalties, passports. How quickly can that be? How quickly right. can we, how can right. we tie other things into this? And, and we have so many examples of government right. abusing information and power repeatedly 
not just China, not just, you know, some other third world country, not Venezuela or, you know, some of these other countries that are having all kind of economic, uh, you know, breakdown. We're, we're experiencing it here. We just had a movement um, all of last year about Black Lives Matter, which many libertarians, uh, you know, I know that some libertarians had some issues with Black Lives Matter and the connection to, uh, you know, communism and Marxism and whatnot. But ultimately, the problem that they were highlighting is one that libertarians have been talking about for years, yes. and that is bad policing, right? And the go you know, government has, uh, uh, you know, and I don't know that it's, I don't know that governments, you know, it's not like Hitler, where Hitler said, this is this goal that I want to achieve, and he hires propagandists. What I think is, I think it's actually a little more insidious because I think oh, yeah. it's more opportunistic rather than um, sitting back and, and developing this idea and then trying to execute it. I think it's, you know, it's more insidious because it's like you take an opportunity and that opportunity in some sense is seized um, by itself, not in the context of a greater plan. So it's easy for, for politicians to say, I don't have this crazy conspiracy plan to do this and that. No. It's just that one step leads to the next that leads to the next because it's all opportunistic well, and we here, need to be I raising can, the alarm. I just throw a little a, a pun or not a pun, a plug, I guess is the right word. The, the next book I'm working on with another uh, another author, we're, we're writing it together, has to do with the social engineering aspect of political rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, and how we can get back to a liberty minded society or species, I should add, because this is bigger than. I know I, I always like to take it there in the, in the grand scheme of things, but step back from this. You say that they, they don't have a, a grand plan. It's just that this is their, you know, what they're doing in that moment. It seems like that from a uh, micro level. Okay. Right. The rhetoric, uh, it's, it's actually, a, it's, it's really beautifully designed. Um, they think that that's what it is, but it's the direction that it's going. Right. It, it's, it's, uh, it's like a snowball effect. Right. And, uh, it's to be quite honest with you, we're following the rhetoric to a T. Yeah. And I'm going to lay that out in the book. That's that's quite a bit more grand than what we're talking about right here. Yeah, but, I got you. Um, you know, when, when we analyze these things, uh, you know, I don't think Kentucky was saying that in a hateful, disrespectful, no, not at all. diminishing manner. Was it a little edgy? Sure. Is it how I normally would communicate or you? No. Right. But you know what? How many people saw it? I know it was bad. And I, but look how quickly, look how quickly, this is extremely telling to me. Look how quickly people jumped on that. Oh yeah. We had to, I, I, you know, I hate hyperbole. I, I hate it. I, I think it's not useful for productive conversation. I want to have meaningful conversation instead mm -hmm. of, and like I, I mentioned on JV's page, instead of talking about what they said, let's talk about why they said it. Right. Let's get, let's get to the meaning of why would, someone tweeting for Kentucky think that there's a, a correlation here between these right. two, you know, yeah. let's spend time talking about that instead. They, and it's legitimate. I mean, you and I just talked about, it. there's a legitimate concern there. Let's, let's talk about that legitimate concern instead. Yep. You know, it's getting blown out of water when literally I've watched the past five years, so much ridiculous hyperbole coming out of both sides. Un mm -hmm. like Trump's very Hitler, like, but right. what's the policy? What are we talking about specifically? Right. And then you see the, the <clears throat> hypocrisy shining through with the migrant detention centers and stuff, how different they're all reacting before and after and who's in office and whatnot. I mean, Biden or Harris hadn't even been down to the, the southern border. And uh, you got more kids in cages right now than you did on Trump. But now, you know, the media is treating it like a honeymoon circus. All right. this is about it's a fight over the rhetoric. That's why they're so pissed off. Oh, yeah. Kentucky using their own rhetoric against them, especially when it's actually used accurately. Right. And that's what and they the interesting don't part. Yeah. The interesting part is when you go back and you look, um, you know, virtually every president since I believe George W. Bush. So George W. Bush. Um, well, I think there's been a couple before him. I think like even Bill Clinton got a little bit of it. But um, uh, there were a number of presidents and presidential nominees who, you know, so you've got like Bill, uh, George Bush, you've got, I think, Bill Clinton as well, Hillary Clinton, um, Barack Obama, definitely Donald Trump. It was really amped up in, under Donald Trump's presidency. You had 
plenty of mainstream media producing tons of articles. You can go back through and look, do a Google search and look at it. There are plenty of comparisons to, uh, to Hitler. And you didn't oh. see all kind of arguments saying, hey, you can't, I mean, you saw some, there were some, there were some people that were pretty consistent and they were saying, look, it's not okay. But by and, far, by and large, the majority of, the, uh, of them were considered okay so long uh, in general, it seems like, as it was a Republican president. You know, when people did it for Obama, it was like, oh, you're a racist if you say something like that, right? But when it, when it happened to Trump, when it happened to George Bush, who were the two biggest ones, it seemed to be okay. And, um, you know, I think, I, you know, we're getting close to our time here. So I want to kind of, if you don't have anything, uh, anything further, I want to close with a, with a quote from an article from 2019. Let me just uh, say one thing. Yeah, the, absolutely. The, Dive in right in there. The double standards, triple standards, you know, I, I, it's it's sad and it's 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 very superficial. Uh, we're not right, having right. quality conversations because of it, um, you know. And I, I don't feel bad, um, or let me say, let me say, this, I, I'm not upset at mm -hmm. the Kentucky f affiliate for doing that. Neither am I. You know, I'm not at all. Um, I, I think that words should be measured and be respectful, and as long as they they're doing so, I think they did mm -hmm. so with the best of intention. Um, you know, because they care about people, uh, like most libertarians do, they care about liberty and freedom of association. Right. Uh, so I think if we focus a little bit more on that and, you know, and not be afraid to call these things out, libertarians right. should, we're not, we don't believe in violence to, uh, uh, get our political points across, but you know what, that doesn't mean we can't be assertive and have a little bit of a bark. Right. Yet, you know, and I, I appreciate that because we don't see enough of that in our party. Uh, right. You can be respectful, you can be civil, but you can also be fierce at the same time. Right. That's all for me. Awesome. So let me let me end on this particular note. So in in June on June twentieth, uh, two thousand nineteen, there was an article that was published. Uh, I believe it was first published in the Washington Post, and the title of it was "Never Again Means Nothing If Holocaust Analogies Are Always Off Limits." And so here's this interesting excerpt that I thought is a good way to close this particular episode. Here's what it said. But even if we, God willing, never get anywhere near the later stages of genocide, never reach the monstrosity of the Third Reich, these analogies can and should serve as our moral compass. We have long asked the question about why good Germans didn't intervene earlier when it was just about discriminatory laws, detention, and boycotts before things got murderous. Now we have to ask ourselves, why aren't we? I hope you enjoyed the show, everyone. That's the end. We do not have any bill review. Uh, we don't have any bill review this time around, but we will be having it in the future. If you're watching on YouTube, please be sure to hit that subscribe button and to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network where the weekly episode of just me airs <laughs> Monday nights at 10 p.m. or join again Josh Fields here with me from the Libertarian Apothecary on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion style episode generally on the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. Finally, remember this. If you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And we're out.